Good evening. My name is Lisa Burke from the Department of Rural Health at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which this webinar is recorded from and streamed to. Myself, I'm on beautiful Yorta Yorta country on the banks of Gaelia. And I know others of you come to this meeting from other traditional nations. I pay my respects to elders of these many nations, past and present, as well as all Aborig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people amongst this evening. I acknowledge that these lands were never ceded and home to the oldest living cultures on the planet. Thank you for taking time to join us tonight. And I'd particularly like to thank Susanna Sheed, the state independent um, MP for Shepparton for attending. Tonight's public webinar is a collaboration between the Department of Rural Health and also the Rotary Club of Ballarat South. I'd like, now like to introduce Alan Crouch to say a few words. Alan is past president of the Rotary Club of Ballarat South and also affiliated with the Department of Rural Health. So thanks, Alan. This partnership with the University of Melbourne and the Rotary Club of Ballarat South, it actually continues a decades long commitment to addressing pandemic viral disease globally. To date and most notably, this has been through the Global Polio Eradication Program. Since 1988, through the Rotary Foundation, local Rotary Clubs around the world have raised more than $2 billion to fund this massive effort. An effort based on intensive immunization everywhere around the world and over the long haul. And right now, we are so close, so close to achieving this goal. The coronavirus pandemic demands no less of us, only a global approach, including universal free access to safe and effective vaccines. Only this will make the world safe for us and for all of its peoples. So to all who've joined us tonight, I hope you find great benefit from this public lecture and thanks for coming along. Thanks, Alan. So um, there'll be an opportunity uh, for members of the audience to ask questions through your Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll attempt to get through as many questions as we have time for. But tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Kim Mulholland. Kim is a paediatrician trained at the University of Melbourne and the Royal Children's Hospital. He also has postgraduate training in immunology, respiratory medicine and tropical medicine. And he joined the Medical Research Council Laboratories, Gambia in 1989, where he developed a program of research covering all aspects of the problem of childhood pneumonia. These studies helped to guide the World Health Organization's policy and contributed to the strategy of integrated management of childhood illness, as well as guiding oxygen and antibiotic management for hospitalised children. Kim has also been involved in the oversight of many vaccine trials, serving on steering committees and data safety monitoring boards for a range of vaccines, and most recently for the COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Mulholland will share his knowledge on COVID-19 vaccines in Australia and across the world. So please welcome Professor Kim Mulholland. Thank you. So uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, like uh, the, uh, the host, I'd certainly uh, like to um, acknowledge the um, elders past and present of the indigenous communities and the indigenous owners of the land on which I'm sitting. And um, I think um, many other um, people are, are sitting in you know, different areas of Australia. So um, I'm sure you'll feel the same way. My task is to speak about the problem of COVID-19 and um, indeed um, try and understand a little bit about how it affects not only Australia and the region. I'm going to do that by um, giving you a general rundown of the illness, uh, but I would also um, uh, like to go into some of the politics of this and um, perhaps also look at the issue of um, vaccine use, the vaccines that are available, and um, how we're going with those vaccines. So let me just start by considering what COVID-19 is. COVID-19 is the name of the disease and it's caused by a coronavirus. And for the non-medical people amongst us, a coronavirus is a type of virus which is quite common. Um, they cause a lot of mild respiratory infections in children and animals, for example, um, bats. Um, and um, in the past, over the past 20 years, coronaviruses um, have been responsible for uh, 
three major um, problems, I would say. The first was known as SARS, which occurred around 2002. Many people at that time thought that this cause of severe pneumonia was going to become a major global problem. It spread to a number of countries, but it then didn't continue. In 2010, we had the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or otherwise known as MERS, another epidemic of severe pneumonia, but largely limited to the Middle East. But then late in 2019, we saw um, uh, something new appearing, which was um, basically uh, a, a bat virus, which appears to have crossed to humans, probably in China. There's, um, there's a good deal of evidence that there's another animal involved, but it's not clear and it probably doesn't matter that much. Uh, the most important thing though, is that in humans, um, this uh, strain started to cause uh, um, a, a lumber of cases of severe pneumonia, which were first seen in Wuhan and first really recognized by this uh, young uh, Chinese doctor who was an ophthalmologist and who um, recognized that there was um, a lot of uh, atypical pneumonias and nasty pneumonias appearing. And he warned his colleagues in Wuhan at the end of December. Sadly, just a month later, uh, he died of the disease himself. The diseases caused by coronavirus, we've all seen pictures of this, the knobbly lumpy things on the surface of the virus, um, what we refer to as the spike protein for obvious reasons. The spike protein is very important because firstly, it enables the virus to get into the human cells and start illness. Um, but also because the vaccines that we've produced up to now, and certainly the very successful ones, have been um, producing antibodies that um, are directed at the spike protein. So the spike protein is a key to our control. But before getting to that, I want to just um, say a few things about what this looks like clinically. Um, mild respiratory infection or no symptoms of, at all is probably the most common clinical manifestation of um, COVID-19. Um, certainly amongst the youth, that is um, the most common. In older people, it's um, perhaps less common. Then there is a kind of moderate respiratory infection lasting for less than a week. Um, in these cases, they, um, you, they may be breathless. Um, sometimes they need oxygen and you may see pneumonia on X-ray. Um, and this is um, also reasonably common um, but the, uh, the real problem is the next category, which are the severe respiratory infections, less common, but they usually start off with the mild or moderate cases. And then after a week or so, uh, they develop quite severe respiratory failure. And those patients often finish up in intensive care. They are often in need of artificial ventilation or even ECMO, which is a more extreme form of ventilation. And... Um, mortality is, uh, is high. Some of them stay on ventilators for long periods of time. So it's a very nasty condition and it's very labor intensive to manage and very difficult for hospitals with limited resources to manage. Finally, there's another category which sometimes called long COVID, which may follow um, mild um, illness, more often moderate illness, <clears throat> but which uh, causes prolonged um, uh, symptoms. And uh, we don't really know how long this debilitating illness is going to last for, but um, quite a lot of people have um, been struck with long COVID. So what are the factors that make a bad outcome likely? Well, overwhelmingly, the most important factor is age. Um, young people, and people young, by young people, I mean under 50 really, um, have very rarely run into trouble. And on this graph here, you can see um, for, uh, from a variety of different countries, the case fatality rate, which is the number of actual cases of COVID-19 that die, that is the fraction of cases that die. And um, under the age of 50, the case fatality rate is generally very low, less than 1%, very few people die. But once you get over 60 or 70 years of age, that number increases and the disease becomes much more dangerous. Other factors are um, gender, Mortality is higher in males, although not a lot. And then underlying conditions, especially um, amongst adults, um, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease or cancer. And amongst children, um, it's um, um, chronic illnesses, uh, cancer as well, uh, major abnormalities. And um, amongst um, children in low and middle income countries, we've found that malnutrition and TB can be associated with severe and fatal outcomes. 
There is also a um, curious disease, which um, is quite rare. It's a kind of immunological disorder um, known um, by either as, um, uh, well, usually known as MISC-C, M-I-S-C. I won't go into the detail of this, but it's a bit like what we call Kawasaki's disease. And it occurs in children uh, after they've had the infection. It's very rare. There's been just a couple of cases in Australia. But the most, most important factor for a bad outcome is poverty and poor treatment. This certainly applies in low and middle income countries and um, also applies in places like America. Now we know how it can be prevented. We see this every day on television. I don't want to go through this in detail, except to say that in Australia, I think we were a bit slow to pick up on the importance of aerosol. Aerosol transmission is important. Uh, and, um, and I think that for that reason, um, masks are very important. But vaccines are much more interesting and much more likely to give us complete control of this disease. Before speaking about that, though, I want to say a couple of things about the global picture. This rather curious looking uh, picture I've shown now is um, a representation of um, the fatal cases, that is the deaths in the world over the last year. And um, the, the three blue parts at the top represent Europe, including the United Kingdom. Uh, and there you can see an initial peak, which occurred in April, May uh, of, um, of last year. Um, the disease seemed to go away until the winter came. And then there's been um, a huge number of cases in Europe. Importantly though, in the middle there, you can see the UK. And the UK, um, despite having been a huge problem at the end of last year, um, their disease rates have gone right down and um, their intensive care units are, are nowhere near as, as full as they were um, just a few months ago because of a very effective um, and, and well-accepted um, vaccination program. That's not the same in all European countries, unfortunately, hopefully that will change. The, red, the red, three red sort of bands in the middle are Latin American countries, Brazil overwhelmingly the worst, um, but the rest of Latin America also has a major problem. Then there's the US, and we're all aware that the US was really the world epicenter of this disease until the end of last year. Uh, and um, amongst the countries at the bottom, I want just to point out India, because India seemed to have been controlling the disease but then just in the last few months, they've really got into trouble. And this graph gives you an idea. Uh, this is again mortality. These are deaths uh, occurring per week. And um, um, you can see Brazil and the United States were um, major contributors, but India has shot past. And uh, this is really a major problem, which I'm going to come to in a little while. So all the countries seem to be behaving differently. What are risk factors for countries to do badly? Well, there are, the risk factors are more um, political than anything else. One is the perception amongst leaders that the economy is more important than ordinary people. Another is a leadership which is in denial. And sadly, we've got some excellent examples of that. And the same, um, the same leaders also tend to engage in conspiracy theories, um, get involved in, in complicated um, and, and really uh, false arguments on social media. And it all amounts to poor governance. And then there's another factor, which is the variance, which I will also discuss. But the poor governance is well exemplified by Brazil's leader. This is a recent um, uh, article for, um, uh, really describing um, the, the Brazilian leader as being um, contributing to what is referred to as a perfect storm of the world coronavirus uh, epicenter in Brazil. Uh, it's, a, it's a shocking situation in Brazil and um, it didn't need to be this bad. So um, I'm going to say a little bit about variants. Now, all viruses change all the time, um, but usually uh, it's, um, it's in a sort of a predictable way. Now, flu predictably changes every year, and that's the reason why we need different vaccines every year. Other viruses are a bit more stable. Now, this virus is an RNA virus, and they are usually less stable, but it has some built-in mechanisms that try to maintain uh, its genetic code and make it um, not as variable, for example, as the flu. Nevertheless, um, with the, the virus circulating all over the world, um, the, um, the variants are occurring all the time. And the important issues about variants are uh, listed here. Firstly, are they more infectious? 
Secondly, do they cause more severe disease? Thirdly, do they risk, do they, excuse me, do they resist immunity that's uh, derived from a vaccine? In other words, can a vaccinated person become ill with this? And fourthly, um, do they resist immunity that's derived from prior infection? That is somebody who's had the illness, can that person then um, get sick again? <clears throat> now, as far as the World Health Organization is concerned, there are three uh, variants that they refer to as variants of concern. UK, Brazil, and South Africa. These maps from WHO are a little bit misleading because it, they make it look like these variants are everywhere. And whilst they have been reported all over the world, um, the UK variant um, has been really the dominant variant in the UK and in uh, some other European countries um, and act, actually has spread elsewhere. And we don't know how important it is in India, I should add that. Brazil is um, important uh, in Latin America and um, has spread to the United States. And the South African variant um, has spread um, to some of the nearby countries in South Africa. And in fact, probably has spread further in Africa than we know about because of um, lack of capacity to do the right kind of genotyping. Um, there are cases that have been seen of the South African variant elsewhere, but it's not really taken hold. So let me answer as much as I can, my, my questions for these variants. Are they more infectious? Well, yes, all three variants have been shown to be significantly more infectious. Uh, exactly how that happens, we're not completely sure, but probably it's by uh, lengthening the time when the individual infected person is infectious. Do they cause more severe disease? This has been reported a number of times, and um, we originally, uh, I think had the impression that um, this, was, this was the case. But when you look very closely at the situation where a variant has taken on in a country, um, it's quite difficult to be sure whether the severe, the, the severe disease that's appearing in the hospitals in large numbers represents a change in the behavior of the virus or really is just a reflection of the fact that the numbers are greater. And whilst the numbers are greater, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the individuals in hospital um, and in the intensive care units are sicker and the mortality seems to be greater. So it's um, surprisingly, um, it's not clear whether the variants cause more severe disease. Do they resist vaccine immunity? The UK, um, one study showed a little bit. In South Africa though, um, two studies which were vaccine trials conducted uh, at a time when the variant was just coming in as it were, um, uh, did show that um, that the um, that the uh, uh, the, the, the South African variant um, actually um, does resist vaccine immunity, and and quite famously the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was involved in a small trial, only two thousand people in South Africa around that time, showed almost no uh, protection um, against the um, against the South African variant. Um, that's not to say that the vaccine is no use in South Africa. I think most of us believe that um, the vaccine will still protect individuals in South Africa against severe disease, but does not seem to protect against transmission and mild disease. What about resisting natural immunity? And here again in South Africa, um, one uh, excellent study uh, was conducted where about a third of the individuals who enrolled, were enrolled in the study already had antibodies suggesting that they'd had prior infection. And that third of individuals um, were still uh, able to be infected in the follow-up study, um, but uh, less. And it seemed like it was about 50% protection rather than probably higher protection if we were not talking about the variant. So the variants are a problem and I'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. But what about vaccination and how are we going in terms of vaccinating the world? because this is a global problem. And this map uh, attempts to show the number of vaccine doses that have been administered per 100 people for all countries in the world. You could say, oh, well, all the countries are doing reasonably well and some are doing better than others. But if you look at the bottom, you can see the scale and the scale is more or less a logarithmic scale. So that all those countries that are shown in pale blue, uh, in fact, have extremely low coverage and uh, this includes most of Africa and uh, really the poor countries of the world. Uh, their coverage is, uh, in, for the most part, less than one um, dose of vaccine for 100 people. 
uh, whereas um, other countries, notably Europe and, um, and most famously Brazil, um, uh, Israel, but also the United States, um, have administered um, much larger numbers of um, doses of vaccine. So the um, distribution of the vaccine uh, in some respects has followed need, but in other respects has just followed um, wealth. And this uh, slide demonstrates dramatically really uh, how this has worked out. If you look at the right-hand uh, panel here, this is the number of doses administered per 100 population again. And at the top in the high income countries, the average is 18. Now that still seems low, but um, that includes some countries that have administered a lot and some that have not. But amongst the low income countries, that's 0.06, in in almost none. So basically um, vaccine use up to now has been dominated by the rich countries and the poor countries have been left out. These are the vaccines that are um, in use and um, there are, this are most of the vaccines in use. There are a couple of others as well. But the, um, the vaccines that are shown in green here are the vaccines that have been given emergency use listing by the World Health Organization. Now this is uh, akin to the emergency use authorization that the US FDA uses. Um, it, uh, it is a bit like licensure, but it um, happens in a much more short term basis. It happens more quickly, um, but it's a bit like temporary licensure. And um, you, what I've shown here is um, all the uh, vaccines that have been approved by WHO for so-called EUL. And um, it looks like there's five, but in fact, there's four. Uh, the first one is the, um, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, which we've all heard about. The second and third AstraZeneca and Serum Institute of India are in fact the same vaccine produced by different people. And that is an adenovirus vaccine. I'll come back to that. The Moderna vaccine is a, um, also an mRNA vaccine, like um, the Pfizer vaccine. And the Johnson & Johnson is another adenoviral vector vaccine. Important difference is the Johnson & Johnson is a single dose. And the virus that is used as a vector, that by a vector, I mean that it carries some uh, DNA that enables it to um, code for the spike protein. Um, that, um, uh, is uh, a human adenovirus, whereas the uh, AstraZeneca one is a chimp adenovirus. The other vaccines, of the vaccines at the bottom, people may be surprised to see Novavax at the bottom, given that they did their first trials in Australia quite a long time ago. Um, in fact, their vaccine's done pretty well in a phase three trial in the UK, but they've had problems um, with production. Uh, the CanSino vaccine, uh, we're not sure of the timeline for this, it's, in a, it's a Chinese vaccine will probably be, um, um, it'll probably be behind the other two Chinese vaccines up here, the ones that are colored in yellow. Um, but those vaccines I'm gonna say a little more about are um, used are now quite a lot around the world. Sinopharm and Sinovac. Both of them are inactivated um, virus vaccines and um, both of them are currently in the process of WHO emergency use listing. The last one I haven't mentioned is the, the Sputnik from the Gamalaya Institute in Russia. So an attempt has been made internationally to try and fix this problem of incredibly unequal and unfair distribution of vaccines. And it's been led by what is um, known as the um, COVAX group or the COVAX initiative, um, which was really set up jointly by CEPI, a Norwegian based organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which provides vaccines for the poor countries of the world, UNICEF and the World Health Organization. And COVAX has its eye on the, the countries that are colored in red here. These are countries um, that um, the ones that are, um, the, have, have the least access to vaccines. The green countries are countries that are in some way contributing to COVAX financially, but also getting some vaccines from COVAX. And COVAX has then tried to do deals with individual vaccine producers to, um, to ensure that um, some vaccine is available for the poor countries. And the most recent data I had indicated that over 53 million COVID-19 vaccines have been distributed um, through the COVAX facility to 121 countries. But which vaccines are being used, um, especially in our region? Now, using the World Health Organization regions, the Wipro region, 
Um, I've listed some of the countries here and the vaccines that they are using. And the dark blue represents AstraZeneca. And um, AstraZeneca is the most widely used vaccine if you don't consider China. I didn't put China on this map because the, uh, it wouldn't fit on this, um, on this chart rather because the number of doses distributed in China is vastly greater than any of the other countries. There are two Chinese vaccines uh, shown here, Sinopharm in the pale blue, uh, which is being used in Cambodia and Laos. And in Mongolia, more recent data shows that Mongolia is using um, mostly Sinopharm now. Um, Sinovac in the green um, has been used in, um, in, in the Philippines, really. Sorry, Sinovac is in the yellow green, which is uh, used in the Philippines. And um, Pfizer is used in the more wealthy countries of Japan and Malaysia. But having said that, Japan and Malaysia have very poor coverage with vaccine up to now. If you move into the WHO Southeast Asia region or the zero countries, these countries are um, really what we would call South Asia. And um, although this uh, information is slightly dated on this chart, the blue vaccine AstraZeneca dominates. And there's a reason for that. And that is because um, India has actually provided vaccine free of charge um, to uh, their neighbours. And so with the exception of Thailand, those other countries shown there um, were vaccinated um, courtesy of the Indian government. Indonesia um, is using the Sinovac, um, the other one of the Chinese vaccines. Thailand uses Sinopharm to some extent. Now we have um, data on the effectiveness and efficacy of these vaccines. Um, certainly the four that I've listed here. The efficacy is how the vaccine performs in a formal trial. And so the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, both were excellent. They gave 95% protection against COVID-19 and high protection against severe disease uh, in a clinical trial. And for both of those vaccines, um, that has been demonstrated now in widespread use of the vaccines in the United States and in, um, in uh, UK and uh, also in Europe. Um, these are highly effective vaccines that have, have really delivered what they said they were going to deliver. The AstraZeneca vaccine and Johnson & Johnson, the other ADNO, are um, somewhat lower in terms of their efficacy against the COVID-19 disease, 66, 67%. But interestingly, um, AstraZeneca has um, a very good record against severe disease and um, has been used very widely now. And UK data shows this to be highly effective actually, and um, a, a very uh, important vaccine. Johnson & Johnson has been used less and mostly in the United States, but also quite efficacious against um, severe disease. What about the Chinese vaccines? So Sinopharm vaccine, as I've mentioned, is an inactivated virus vaccine. Now it's been trialed in these three, these four rather um, Middle Eastern countries, a fairly large trial, uh, 30, 40,000 people. Um, and they did, they, they provided to WHO an analysis after 58 cases of which 48 were in the placebo group and 10 in the vaccine group. And so simple arithmetic tells you that the vaccine was 79% protective but there's been some problems with this one. And this is um, actually from the news today. And uh, <clears throat> this, um, I don't know any more about this other than it's been reported in the news. And that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Seychelles, which uh, is a um, small and beautiful country uh, of 100,000 people of whom 60% are vaccinated. The Seychelles is the most highly vaccinated country in the world at the moment. And most of the vaccine that's been given has been Sinopharm. Now, since the beginning of May, they've had a large number of new cases, 500 new cases in three days. This is a population of 100,000. It's, what is that, half of Geelong or something. It's a, it's a small population, but a large number of cases and quite a significant number of deaths. And interestingly and importantly, a third of their cases are reported to have been vaccinated with two doses of vaccine. This is really a problem. And um, I don't know any more about it than what I've written down here, but it raises questions about Sinopharm, which as you can see is being used quite widely. How about Sinovac, the other leading Chinese vaccine? A different kind of trial was done, but it was done in three countries, um, Brazil, Turkey, and Indonesia. They found variable efficacy actually, and surprisingly 51% in Brazil, 83% in Turkey. Could this be real? The same 
the same vaccine being used with the same kind of protocol. In fact, to understand the difference between these two figures, um, you have to look at the number of cases that were found. The Brazil study uh, involved healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers, and they were given the opportunity, as far as I understand it, to get tested whenever that suited them or whenever they felt like they might have had an infection. So there were a lot of cases found that were very mild and had very few symptoms. And when I looked at the information from this trial and removed the cases that were either asymptomatic or classified as very mild, the, uh, the figure gave um, a, a result almost the same as Turkey, so about 80% efficacious. And that's probably accurate. And the reason I'm saying that is because of this information from Chile, where um, several millions of uh, doses of vaccine um, have been given. This is, again, the Sinovac. It's also called Coronavac. That's a bit confusing, but same vaccine in Chile. Chile has a big problem, which I think most people are aware of. They've had a second wave, which has been going for quite some months, and they've had a lot of deaths. This, this is not cases. This, uh, this particular chart shows deaths. Now, a, um, an analysis of the effectiveness of the vaccination program came to these concluding, the, these figures really, 67% protection against any symptomatic COVID-19, 85, 89 and 80% protection against hospital admission, intensive care admission and death respectively. In fact, this really um, suggests that the, 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 the vaccine is pretty effective at preventing severe disease. And, um, I looked at this and thought, well, who was vaccinated? Well, the people who were vaccinated were uh, actually the older age groups. In Chile, they chose the, um, the um, 60 to 70 and 70 plus age groups to start with. And at the time of this analysis, um, a large fraction of those age groups had been vaccinated and relatively few of the younger ones. But the most compelling information from my side um, came with this particular uh, result which is um, showing a picture of new admissions to intensive care unit over the past several months, in fact, since January, by age. <clears throat> the, the three charts at the top are for um, the three young age groups, 0 to 40, 40 to 50, and 50 to 60. And in those three age groups, the, um, the second wave of disease and intensive care admission is really evident from um, the, uh, the, end of, uh, the end of February, actually. But over the same period of time, the three older age groups that were vaccinated, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and plus over 80, um, they didn't see the wave. In fact, um, the, the, um, that group seems to be very largely protected. And for me, this is very strong evidence that this is a very effective vaccine. So these two vaccines, um, there are still some questions about Sinopharm, largely because of the recent data from, um, from, from, um, from the Seychelles, um, but uh, they are uh, similar vaccines. Many millions of doses have been administered and they have been said to be safe. But the safety monitoring uh, is an issue which, <coughs> which, um, which comes up and which I want to say a little bit about because it, people are very anxious about the safety of these vaccines for pretty good reasons. If you give them to a whole population, um, you really want the vaccine to be safe. Now, during the AstraZeneca trials uh, towards the end of last year, we first started to see some safety em issues emerging um, with a couple of cases of what we call transverse myelitis. Now, for the non-medical people, this is um, a sort of immune condition that affects the spinal cord and can lead to paraplegia. So this is obviously a very serious condition and usually very rare. Um, the trials were paused, but they were continued. And in fact, this has not re-emerged as an issue. So they must have been just random events. However, since the introduction of AstraZeneca's vaccine, um, there has been um, I've, what I've referred to here as a rare clotting problem. It gets re reported in the press in lots of different ways. And there's been um, a lot of different terms used, but the one that the international community has settled on is thrombosis with throm thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS. Thrombosis just means clot and thrombocytopenia means a low number of platelets, which is the uh, cells in the bloodstream which are responsible for clotting. Now, it's not common for amongst other um, uh, conditions to have these two things happening together. 
And um, what's been happening after vaccination, in fact, during the two weeks after vaccination, in most cases, is uh, a clot occur occurring either in the cerebral veins, in the abdominal veins, um, particularly the vein that runs through the liver, and um, sometimes in other, well, in other parts of the body as well. This is obviously a nasty condition with significant mortality, although it can be treated. Uh, but even when it's treated, there is a, um, it looks like around 20% mortality. This um, is an ongoing issue. In fact, I've um, just before this meeting, I've been on a, another call with WHO about this issue. There's more information coming in all the time. <clears throat> the information I've got here is from the European Union and the UK. Um, and at the time when there were 34 million people who'd received the vaccine, there were 169 cases of cerebral vein thrombosis and 53 cases of abdominal vein thrombosis. Now, it sounds like a lot, but if you um, put that in the picture of 34 million people, um, it's not so many. Um, at the same time, there have been similar reports with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the other adenovirus vaccine. Smaller numbers, 15 cases, all women, three of them have died, and these were in the United States. I, I would point out that there are two other adenoviral vaccines, which we don't know anything about. We've been looking in the Gamalaya, the people who've received Gamalaya um, vaccine uh, and have up till now found no evidence of this occurring in Russia. So this is a nasty condition. It seems that the incidence is between one and 10 per million. And it seems that it's more common in women and more common in younger people. In fact, in, the, uh, in Europe, uh, over 90% of cases were under the age of 50. People struggle to demonstrate what is the, what, what is the, what does these risks mean? And so this uh, group from Cambridge University have put together a graphic which tries to demonstrate what the risk is. And on the right side of this graphic by different age groups, you can see an estimate of the risk of um, what they call potential harm um, or serious harm uh, in 100,000 people. So 100,000 people are vaccinated. If those 100,000 people are 20 to 29 years old, you would expect one case. If they are my age group, 60 to 69, then you will expect 0.2 cases. So the incidence is uh, lower in older people um, and as I said before, it's slightly higher in women. On the other side of the ledger there in the blue is the, um, the uh, number of intensive care admissions that would be prevented by vaccinating people. And um, it's like a comparison of risk. And you can see that at the, in the youngest age group, the, um, the, the risk and the benefit seem to be sort of equal. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you go to the older age groups, the benefit greatly outweighs the risk because the risk of disease is so much greater. And because of this analysis, the um, British have decided to use the AstraZeneca vaccine only for people over the age of 30. Um, on the next graph, I've got um, a more realistic uh, picture for Britain. This was um, actually based on data that was, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, an analysis that was done in the, in the UK in February. And you can see, again, this is a much stronger emphasis showing that really in all age groups, um, the balance of, um, of risk versus benefit is very much on the side of um, the vaccine. <coughs> Excuse me. The understanding of risk, though, is very difficult. I tried to think of some analogies to predict, to, to uh, demonstrate what it means to have a risk of, um, uh, of one in 100,000 or um, 0.1 in 100,000. One in 100,000 is basically, um, if you go to um, a grand final EMCG where there's 100,000 people, one of those people might be struck down by a rare disease. Um, it's similar to the serious reactions associated with yellow fever vaccine. It's much less common than serious reactions associated with penicillin. It's very rare, actually. But despite this, um, many countries have really um, perhaps overreacted to the, the risks associated with AstraZeneca vaccine and limited it to older people as Australia have done and a number of European countries have done. This has hugely damaged the overall confidence in COVID vaccines and ultimately may make, us difficult, may make it more difficult for us um, to vaccinate younger populations. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, I want for a minute then to go and, and, um, and rethink about India because India is um, on everyone's mind at the moment. And um, in many ways, it's telling us what may happen in most of the countries, that is the poorer countries of the world. On this graph, which um, was um, from August of last year, and this is a time when I was working with a group of Indian physicians trying to figure out what was going on there. And at that time, the, the mortality rate in India from COVID-19 was roughly the same as Australia. Obviously the population is larger, but the, the risk of death seemed to be roughly the same. And India seemed to have turned the corner. And analysis that we did around that time for Delhi, for example, showed that in that city with a population of 30 million, um, there was 156,000 COVID, um, COVID cases had been detected and 4,000 deaths. Um, it sounds like a lot, but it's not that many really in a city of 30 million. Curiously though, there was a zero survey done in Delhi at the same time. That is a random sample of Delhi uh, residents were then um, gave a blood sample and um, they were shown to have antibodies in their blood indicating that had previously been infected. So these figures, which um, uh, show that relatively small number of cases, uh, and yet 29% of the population um, had been infected. And if we multiplied that out, we came to an infection fatality rate of 0.05%, much lower than the rest of the world. And it created the idea that Indian communities, for whatever reason, seem to have some intrinsic um, resistance to this. Other data from Pune um, showed a similar sort of story. Um, and, uh, but the most interesting was from this place, which is Dharavi. It's a slum uh, in, um, in Mumbai, and it's a pretty crowded and um, densely populated and very poor community. Uh, and in fact, they had um, quite a bit of um, disease in, in uh, Dharavi. They were quite well, ex uh, quite well organized when it came to um, uh, contact tracing and, um, and, and um, public health. And um, uh, in fact, they finished up with um, rather few deaths and um, the disease seemed to go away in Dharavi. And yet when a zero survey was done in Dharavi, uh, as it was done in Delhi earlier, over 50% of people had seen the virus. Why was mortality low? We're not really sure. But we had the idea that the so-called herd immunity threshold, which is the proportion of a population that needs to be immune to stop the virus from circulating, may have been achieved even with 50 to 60% positivity. I didn't really believe it, but um, on the other hand, I, had, I couldn't see any other um, uh, explanation. And I did believe that India had somehow controlled this problem. Certainly Prime Minister Modi believed it, and he um, really reacted um, um, triumphantly, really, I guess, and um, uh, announcing to the world that India had really conquered um, the problem of COVID-19 and um, opening up the, the country, um, actually holding um, quite a lot of uh, political rallies and um, allowing some very large um, religious um, um, festivals to take place. Um, this was in September of last year. And this is what's happened now. Now it's not completely clear um, precisely why India has gone into this situation, but it's disastrous. These are new deaths attributable to COVID-19 in India up to today. And uh, my colleagues in India tell me that this is a fraction, maybe um, a quarter, maybe one tenth of the total number of deaths. Many people are dying at home. Many of the older people are not getting near the hospitals. Um, it is an unimaginable catastrophe. How this happened, I don't know. Um, this recent article in the conversation um, highlights the, um, uh, how essentially what it says is that the Modi government prioritized politics over public health, which I think we have to agree that that's probably what happened. Um, and they certainly did um, do quite a lot of politics, but um, <clears throat> the situation is, is terrible. And uh, to think that India, which is um, the largest vaccine producer in the world, not only the largest vaccine producer in the world, it produces most of the vaccines in, in the world, um, is running out of vaccine or has run out of vaccine in many of the cities. They've run out of oxygen. They, they are really struggling in India and it's a deplorable situation. Now, I can hear um, people in the audience saying, well, 
what about the variant? Maybe a variant has come in and become much more um, infectious and that's what's caused all the trouble. Well, it's true. And this is a, a publication from just a few days ago from the, um, the Indian National Institute of Virology, which shows that there is a variant which has some of the characteristics of the other ones that I've spoken about. Probably it's more infectious. Um, we don't know whether it's um, more, more, more likely to lead to a fatal outcome, but um, it's likely there'd be a combination of factors, one of which is the variant, um, but there may be other factors as well. <clears throat> so there are lessons here. And these are lessons not only for India, but particularly for other Pakistan and other similar countries to, to look at very carefully. And also for African countries. Many African countries have had an initial wave which settled down and they're sort of going back to normal. And um, for reasons that we really don't understand, um, I worry that we're going to see this Indian situation repeated in different places to different extents. So we are, um, we are in a very dangerous situation uh, when it comes to the poor countries of the world, uh, just as the richer countries of the world are starting to control the disease. <clears throat> Not only that, and uh, as a paediatrician, I, I really have to say a couple of words about the effect on children. As we know, children very rarely get serious disease with COVID-19, but um, measles uh, is a serious disease. And in the, the year before the pandemic, 2019, it's estimated that there were 207,000 measles deaths in the world. That's the worst for more than a decade. So the global measles eradication program is not working, basically. And since the pandemic, um, many uh, countries have, um, have um, stopped or, or restricted immunization programs. The number of children protected against measles is much, much, um, much, much less. And there is a huge number of children susceptible. And um, it's just the limitation on international travel and other things has sort of kept a lid on it for the moment. But I fear we are looking at a major pandemic of measles, and that will be accentuated by what's been um, already described as um, a, a pandemic of poverty and malnutrition. Um, and um, we don't, this is not exclusively due to the pandemic, but it's largely due to the pandemic, and um, increasingly will be the pandemic plus the effects of climate change. <clears throat> but another thing which we sometimes forget about is education. A lot of countries have closed their schools for long periods of time. And um, those closed schools um, in Mongolia, for example, for over a year, mean um, for many children, that's the end of their education. And for many young girls, um, that really is their, the end of their single life. The number of child marriages in Indonesia has gone up enormously, and that's been seen in many parts of the world. So there are many other issues um, related in some way to the pandemic which affect children and which are really pretty devastating. <clears throat> there are some lessons here for Australia. <clears throat> vaccination is essential. Um, it is unlikely to stop the circulation of the virus, but it will stop serious illness and death in older people. Australia is going to face some hard decisions in the coming months and years, I think. I don't see the rest of the world getting rid of this virus completely. Having said that, I was um, in conversation with colleagues at Pfizer just a few days ago when they told me that they were um, working on vaccinating the children of America down to infancy. Um, they already have a license to vaccinate down to 12 years of age. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm not convinced that most countries of the world will go ahead and do this, which means that the virus is going to continue circulating. And so we in Australia are going to have to um, except that we're living in a world where many, perhaps most countries of the world continue to have COVID, um, to a, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating mostly in the younger community with the older communities um, protected by vaccination. This is gonna be a difficult thing for us to deal with. My last comment, um, I don't need to qualify it too much because I, I watch and I see Australia um, um, being increasingly inward looking. Um, <coughs> As um, somebody who's um, been uh, spent a good deal of my life in Africa, um, I, I'm looking at Ethiopia. Uh, I remember Ethiopia uh, 30, 35 years ago when I was working there. Um, a civil war was going on in Ethiopia. There was huge numbers of um, individuals su suffering from famine. There was a large number of displaced people went to the Sudan. And the Australian community was rallying. The Age newspaper 
had a, a, a big campaign for um, to to fund um, wells to be built in the province of Tigray, which is the worst affected province. And today, as we speak, Tigray is again affected by war and famine, and again, huge numbers of people are flooding into the Sudan. But I don't see the same uh, international approach in Australia. And it's not just limited to this. Um, this is something that's been evident to many people who uh, live and work in Geneva, in the UN agencies. Australia used to be a country that was referred to as uh, fighting above their weight uh, when it came to um, uh, as a, being a global citizen and um, uh, essentially um, uh, the good that they were uh, essentially um, promoting um, human rights and promoting um, uh, all, all the, the right things in the world. And um, unfortunately, over the last 20 years, that, um, that impression has changed. And we're now seen as an inward looking country that's mostly focused on um, their own uh, benefit and their own well-being. And I think the, um, the, the, our attitude to vaccination and COVID-19 and our attitude to helping the countries in our immediate, re immediate region uh, reflects that. So I want Australia to um, start to learn again to become a good global citizen as uh, we were in the past. So on that rather um, sad note, I, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Kim. Um, you've covered a lot of uh, a lot of issues and a lot of data there. Um, we've got quite a few questions. We we only got time for a few, so I'll just pick a few and and see how we go. Um, what what do you see happening here in Australia in terms of our vaccination regime? Um, and do you think it will lead to us having to have annual boosters and, and so forth to cope with new variants that come out all the time? Yeah, good question. Um, there are uh, different reasons why annual variants, uh, annual boosters may be needed. One, of course, is the variants and um, the leading companies are all working on um, vaccines that cover the common variants that I've spoken about. Um, another reason is that we don't actually know the duration of protection, even by the highly successful vaccines. And it may well be that that duration is um, not lifelong as you would see for measles, but rather short term, more like flu or something like that. So I, I think we're probably going to be needing annual boosters. Yes, uh, I, I'm not sure whether we're going to um, have a major program of child vaccination. I, I'm not part of these discussions. Um, I, I think that the discussions are going on though, and I suspect they're going on in the United States and elsewhere as well. Mm. And do you think that will happen, a childhood immunisation? Actually, I, I, my, my guess is that it won't happen globally and uh, it won't happen sufficiently to completely um, uh, prevent the virus from circulating in Australia. And um, therefore, um, one would have to say at an individual level, the, um, the vaccine would be given for the protection of the individual child. That's, um, uh, that's just what I think will happen. It may not be the best thing to happen, but I think that's probably the more likely outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And you've given us some pretty convincing data on um, you know, why we should have a vaccine, particularly um, for older people. What, putting it all together, what might you say to someone who's a little bit unsure? still a little bit hesitant given the stuff in the media and so forth what might you say to them about why they might have a vaccine well um firstly i, I will say that the um the, the vaccines are extraordinarily safe when you consider the the huge number of doses that have been given all vaccines have some uh, adverse effects and they're usually very um very rare and these ones are very rare extremely rare I uh, tried to portray it with my analogy of you know, one person in the, the MCG of 100,000 people, or for my age, it would be one person in five MCGs with 500,000 people. Um, that's an extremely low risk. It's, um, and, and so that shouldn't be a reason not to be vaccinated. Um, the, the other factor is that um, I think that in the future, we, we'll all need to be vaccinated um, if, we, if we want to travel. Um, if we want to stay in a kind of cocoon um, surrounded by vaccinated people and hope that um, the virus doesn't come in, well, that's a possibility at the individual level. But um, I personally wouldn't like to live like that. Uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, we, we have to resume our place in the world and the vaccine offers us that opportunity. So I would encourage all people to be vaccinated. The more people who get vaccinated, 
the greater the level of immunity in the community. And that immunity in the community um, is really um, what people refer to as herd immunity. And that means that if the virus gets into the community, it's got nowhere to go. If the virus comes in, for example, into, into Melbourne, and there's, um, there's a couple of cases, and um, all the people that they come in contact with have been vaccinated, then it, it, the virus doesn't have far to go. So that's um, herd immunity, and um, that's important. Yeah. And do you think we'll get to that point where we're able, the vaccine will allow us to open international borders? Yeah. No, I think that's clear. Um, the, the results in, in the UK have been pretty dramatic when you consider where they were just a few months ago. Um, the vaccines are actually hugely effective. I don't want to sort of overstate it because we haven't got clear measures of the level of herd immunity that, that in different communities and so on. But if you look at Israel, look at the, um, the even what's happening in the United States. Yeah, the, um, the, the disease will be controlled. I think that the challenge is going to come when the disease is brought down to very low levels, there may be still the occasional cases, there may be still some people who are not vaccinated. And it might be that the youth and the children are not vaccinated and that's gonna be challenging because um, it's less incentive for people to go and get vaccinated if there seems to be no risk anymore. Um, so it's, yeah. um, I, I can see these things happening in the future. It's gonna be a changing situation. I personally, I'm, I'm 68 years old I have to stop and think. I'm 68 years old, and I personally um, wouldn't want to be going to the future um, without the vaccine. I was, you know, uh, very quick to um, line up for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah. 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 Great to hear. And we we had a question earlier about your protection after the first dose, particularly for older people. Is <coughs> there some protection after the first dose, or it doesn't kick in until? both. Yeah, the, the, um, the trials have shown this quite clearly. <clears throat> there is protection after the first dose, um, especially for the, um, the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, it, it seems to come after about day 12. And in fact, the, the protection after the first dose is quite convincing, actually. And some people have even argued that maybe one dose is enough. Although I think the, um, the authorities are right to go for a second dose <clears throat> but the reason why we've put back and i say we because that's i was on the world health organization committee that was thinking about this um we put back the uh, decision about the second dose um uh, the sorry the timing of the second dose to 12 weeks um and that um that is because there is adequate protection during that 12 weeks there's no need to hurry with that second dose and by giving it later you get a stronger antibody response which is probably going to provide more long-lasting immunity uh, there is similar information about uh, Pfizer, um, but um, less because the trial was um, strictly done with um, only three weeks between the, the doses. Moderna was four weeks between the doses. So yep. less information, but um, information being collected now suggests also that one, one, one dose is quite effective. Johnson & Johnson vaccine is one dose only. Yep. Okay. And just one final question and before I let you go for your evening. Um, We've got a question here about the mRNA vaccines and perhaps why previous mRNA vaccines haven't been successful, but Pfizer is. Is that about the specific virus or? Um, I don't, I'm not sure what the question is referring to. Um, I know I've been following the technology. It's, um, it's been developed in, in the United States at NIH. It's fabulous technology. Um, my understanding is that um, this is um, this is a new type of vaccine, and um, it's uh, it, it's surprisingly successful. And in fact, um, it looks now that we'll be looking at mRNA vaccines against um, flu and maybe a variety of other illnesses. They can be produced um, much more um, easily, in fact, because they're um, they're sort of synthetic in a way, and um, they um, they can also be used to produce protein that can be used as uh, therapeutic agents. So there's a lot of research going on to produce um, uh, highly specialized drugs that can be delivered through mRNA. So it's a fantastic, um, a fantastic new development. Uh, and I, I think um, all of us um, and possibly even the Pfizer people have been surprised at how effective it's been, been yeah. dramatically effective. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a fantastic technology that, yes. yeah can be applied to a lot of different things now from what I've read. Yeah, 
Well, um, Kim, I'd like to thank you for such a fantastic talk for encouraging us to think globally um, and to think um, not only about the virus and vaccines and ourselves, but also about the policies and where Australia might be heading. So thank you on behalf of the Rotary Club of Ballarat South and the University of Melbourne Department of Rural Health. I'd like to thank you for your time this evening and thank everybody um, for attending. And we hope you found um, the lecture interesting. Have a good evening. Okay.